Thanks, Alex. Padlock. Right, the padlock, it's a, it's a hardy general purpose tool. Um, it can be used to keep a box locked or to link two chains together. A uh, padlock has a unique key that can unlock it and it helps you provide, it provides you with a confidential space in the physical world. Uh, given, of course, that someone doesn't have heavy duty wire cutters or lock picking tool and sufficient state in the art, skill in the art. Um, a padlock is also the symbol of HTTPS. Specifically, it's used in browsers to indicate that a website is being accessed with transport layer security. Um, and also that the website has a valid security certificate. This idea is not exactly the same as what a padlock is in physical reality. HTTPS implies much more than just confidentiality. It implies identity and trust. To the average user, this complex notion of cryptographic security expressed by the padlock symbol is not always understood. I asked a few people what the padlock symbol stood for. I don't know, the padlock to me is, I don't know, pirate browsing, I guess? I'm not sure. It's a level of security, I guess, it signifies. I don't know. He's anxious about the point. Yeah, it, it, it's the most British <laughs> response ever that it, he I, I mean, he's he's it has a sign history. that is the same as privacy browsing so that you don't have any cookies or other things saved, but I can't comment on what they are because I don't really know. <laughs> Back to the padlock question. <laughs> what is the padlock in a browser and what is in it In a doing? browser? I believe it, it uh, I, I think, it's, uh, it tells you that uh, the website you're currently looking at has a certificate that assures that it's it's safe. Hurrah! Yeah. Hurrah! Yeah. And Hurrah! then sometimes, you know, you get a little warning like, oh, this this website doesn't have a certificate, so it doesn't have a little padlock or something. Hurrah! Do you notice when a website doesn't have a certificate? It pops up. What does it yeah. say when it pops up, and what do you do? I keep Panic. going. I think it's there to keep us, or try to keep us safe, but what is safe online? I don't think it exists. <laughs> right, so that, that, guy had, that guy had the right idea, uh, but not everyone is so well informed. And, and you may notice that he said that if your site doesn't have a certificate, it pops up, interestingly enough. So people don't always know what this lock is supposed to express, but they know it has to do with security and safety, and that it evokes this sort of warm sense of trustworthiness. Um, studies have been done to show um, how much information can be conveyed with a, a little lock icon or security indicators to the general population, and the most is around two bits of information. And that's being generous. Uh, the two bits that are currently being used are your empty, your lock symbol, no lock symbol, lock symbol with sort of a red X or indicator, and then the dubious yield sign in front of the lock. Um, it's the job of the security user experience engineer to express to the consumer the security characteristics of a web page, even if security, even if visitors are not security minded or necessarily sophisticated. This is one of the earliest browsers that supported encryption. Netscape 2. Before the padlock icon, we had the key icon. Uh, it looked somewhat like a gun and a circle, but um, the, a complete key meant that you have a site that's fully validated HTTPS, and this broken key indicated that you were on HTTP, or some sort of non-secure protocol. This is acting as a negative indicator. Note that modern browsers no longer do this. Now, HTTPS, had a very definite meaning in the early days of the internet. Now, TLS is a point-to-point -point protocol. In this case, the points are the browser and the server. Typically, a web server is a was a physical machine owned by the website owner in some data center somewhere physical. And data is protected from the browser through the local network, through the ISP, through the internet exchange, through the backbone, all the way to the data center in which the server resides. Now, data is cryptographically protected from tampering and observation from any one of these intermediates. 
And in this model, it makes sense to represent this to the client, where the server is under physical control of the website, and the browser is the other end of the point. Businesses were confident enough with this model to enable secure logins and financial transactions, and the e-commerce business flourished. Now, as, as user, internet, <coughs> user access to the internet increased, protecting data on these edge networks, or the, the networks that people connected to the internet from, became even more important. HTTPS protected you from any attackers that may be on shared Wi-Fi, mobile networks, shady ISPs, or any other means by which you access the internet. Uh, HTTPS protects against all of these, um, providing confidentiality, authentication, and cryptographically strong in integrity. Still, the majority of sites in the early days of the web still served plain HTTP. This had a lot to do with cost. Computational, operational, and financial cost. Certificates were expensive to procure, difficult to deploy, and the code itself to, r to run the cryptographic algorithms was slow. Now, over the years, several trends emerged to change what this, the server side of this equation looked like. You may all be familiar with this, up into the right graph. This is Moore's Law. Uh, for general purpose computers, computing per dollar increases exponentially over time, something on the order of doubling every 18 months. However, with an investment in custom hardware, you can drastically reduce the cost of a specific algorithm in exchange for flexibility. This early demand for cryptography for the early days of the internet um, inspired a new type of machine called the cryptographic load balancer. Using custom hardware, you could write cryptography that actually ran fast and was able to scale to the costs that were associated with these early websites. Uh, these appliances sold by companies like F5 and Barracuda proliferated among high traffic sites looking for cost savings and performance improvements while implementing HTTPS. This technology created a subtle change in the way that TLS is managed on the server, taking the crypto out of the application and putting it into a server. All, everything behind it had to be, had to be processed by a, se a separate application. Now, this next hop from where the TLS is, is terminated to the application was usually sent over plain text, no encryption or security at all. And this is because you are in the same data center, you could connect a physical wire. Now, cryptographic accelerators help reduce the computational cost of crypto by introducing this custom hardware, but eventually Moore's Law caught up, as well as hardware manufacturers. With the help of new cryptographic standards, such as AES, that's no longer that new, um, <clears throat> these became integrated into our common mainstream processors, so including Intel's AESNI instructions and the equivalent on ARM devices, it is now cost effective to do encryption in general purpose hardware. Now, general purpose hardware also became fast enough to create fully virtualized systems. Easy to provision virtual machines help trigger a revolution in the way that web services are built. We call it uh, the cloud, right? Now, many web services no longer live in data, dedicated data centers owned by the business. Instead, they're running on hardware operated by third parties. For example, this may not be the case anymore, but Instagram was built entirely on AWS. The cloud does not resemble a data center in that it's not a building with walls and computers inside and wires. Uh, it's an amorphous, flexible, and extensible set of computing entities that you can use. However, there's a saying that goes, there is no cloud, just other people's computers. This is true. Though a virtual machine necessarily runs on a physical machine, and virtual networking relies on, underlying, on the underlying network. Cloud computers are connected and to each other and to the broader network with standard networking equipment and standard protocols. Uh, these two trends of cheaper cryptography and moving to the cloud have fostered a natural evolution of the crypto accelerator market. Instead of placing 
this server endpoint for TLS in a hardware load balancer inside your data center. Websites are moving to services like Cloudflare, like others that act as crypto accelerators in the cloud, and they terminate TLS there. Let's look at a hypothetical modern web property. As you can see, it made up of many, many different services. So after the data gets past the TLS termination point, data is passed into the application. Now this may consist of not just one web server, but a series of analytics services, worker queues, log managers, databases, virtual machines, and containers of many types across different hosts operated by different entities. Uh, data in each one of these arrows is not only passed as HTTP passed as HTTPS, but they could be with remote procedure calls or other API requests. Now this is a complicated service. This is a web, complicated web service. Even a simple personal website has these ramifications. Who here has a site on GitHub pages, for example? I can see a few hands, yeah. So if you, you can have HTTPS on your GitHub page, and it will show up in the browser with the lock icon, but it is perhaps w using Cloudflare in front. Cloudflare will terminate it. GitHub uses Fastly as their, their next layer of crypto accelerator, and then per perhaps behind that it's HTTP. There's no really good way to know from your request connecting to your GitHub page's account what is happening to your data beyond the first hop. Now, even if all your software, you're a big corporation and all your software is managed in-house, although on the cloud, geography can play a big role. For redundancy, many services use multiple data centers. Once data is decrypted, it's passed between services and databases, often over the internet. To improve latency and performance, these termination points are moved geographically even closer and closer to the end user. We've heard this to referred, referred to as the edge network. So requiring these server-to-server -server network communications to be encrypted and protected um, requires them to cover a lot more ground as they become geographically dispersed. Now, even Google used this model. People may remember this slide. Um, terminating encryption at a load balancer called the Google front end um, and leaving it unencrypted beyond. Um, I'm told this has been fixed. I think in a previous talk it was mentioned this is fixed. Um, but in any case, the way services are built now cause data to go through a maze of geographically diverse services. There's no longer just a trusted load balancer on top of a server, just cloud services and application. So securing this backend is a huge challenge and one that many companies are currently tackling. Um, Brian from Netflix described, demonstrated yesterday that mutually authenticated TLS between services is something they're working on and they still haven't come to the finality of solving that solution uh, or solving that problem. Um, expressing the immense, immense complexity of this system in two bits of information, such as the lock, is impossible and probably the wrong thing to do. But as a thought experiment, is there a way to embed the structure of where data goes into HTTP or TLS itself? The answer is maybe, but probably not. Some ideas are we could try to tag every server that a request is sent through. We can imagine embedding this identity information in, into the request over each leg of the trip. There's a header that's standardized in HTTP called VIA that is supposed to be used by proxies, but it's not universally used. And there's nothing stopping any intermediate proxies or intermediate services from forwarding data unencrypted or adding a header using some sort of weak encryption along the way. How do you know that any services past where your TLS is terminated aren't transmitting the data unencrypted somewhere along the way? There was a proposal in a recent paper on HTTPS and CDNs that involved DNSSEC and Dane and some complicated delegation logic. Um, but it failed to provide a way to assure that data hasn't been modified other than transferred through an encrypted tunnel. Um, another proposal is to digitally sign data inside HTML. But this moves your, your data protection problem to the next layer up. TLS works on layer six, 
you're just providing a, t a layer seven solution to the same problem. The back end is simply too complex to be represented and presented to end users in a comprehensible way. But that doesn't mean that we're down the river, right? Um, the financial and operational reasons to, do H to not do HTTPS have mostly been eradicated. Uh, universal SSL, Let's Encrypt, and even Start SSL's free certificates has done a lot to make HTTPS adoption simple, cost effective, and operationally easy to do. Um, AESNI inside Intel processors has also made it computationally free. We're on our way to a web that supports HTTPS by default everywhere. However, as I described, the Netscape era client server model no longer applies for most web services. So why do we use the same security indicators in the browser as we did in 1996? Well, it's clear that HTTPS is a very important part of web security. Attackers on the local network are an ever-present danger, and the majority of man-in-the-middle style attacks that are described happen on the local network. But one has to ask, um, why is HTTPS, which is not equivalent to data security, elevated to the status of a browser indicator at all? If HTTPS is not definitively secure, HTTP is definitively insecure. A more reasonable approach is to go back to one of the ideas from Netscape, which is to use a negative security indicator for HTTP. Excuses to not encrypt sites are mostly gone, and sites will follow. Now, browser indicators are moving this way. In fact, they're moving away from presenting HTTP as just neutral and instead turning HTTP into just another security warning. There's a Chrome setting, I turned it on for this diagram, to mark HTTP traffic as insecure. There's a small X on the lock right there. Um, in Firefox, there was a recent change that if there's a password submission form that is over HTTP, you're gonna get the same sort of negative security indicator. This idea is getting traction and it's spreading. But people have been taught to look for the padlock for years. Do we expect people to unlearn this behavior? Well, over and over it's been shown that if a positive security indicator is missing, most users will not notice. This is true for the padlock as it is for bank websites that show you an authentication image. If this special image doesn't show up on a phishing site, most people won't notice and will click through. In the seminal work, The Emperor's New Security Indicators, given a missing padlock, 92% of informed users entered their passwords. So moving to a ne negative, sec negative security indicator world, it's a risky proposition psychologically. Today, in 2016, most of the web is not encrypted. The last thing that you wanna do is to train people to ignore security indicators. Warning fatigue, is a real issue as users of Windows Vista can attest to. However, we're fast approaching the tipping point on the web where most sites are HTTPS by default. As a website owner, you should prepare, prepare for this change by enabling HTTP, HTTPS and automating the renewal of certificates to avoid the expired certificate problem. And as an end user, you should expect this change to be happening in the coming months, not years. After negative security indicators for HTTP are introduced, a broken lock icon on a browser will no longer cause the cognitive dissonance that is associated with a neutral indicator for HTTP. Currently, a site with an expired certificate appears more threatening than a purely unencrypted site. Instead of meaning your clock is wrong, or the website misconfigured their SSL certificate, or the rare sliver of a chance that you're subject to a man in the middle attack, the majority of times, HTTPS warnings will mean the same thing as an open padlock. This site is not secure, messages can be read by passive eavesdroppers and modified by active attackers. Additionally, I think the closed lock icon should be de-emphasized. It's important for websites, web services, and mobile application backends to secure themselves. 
Tapped wires and compromised clouds should be in every corporation's threat model. The application security measures, <coughs> such as requiring all data to be transferred between applications to be encrypted, are quite in vogue right now, as they should be. However, trusting the network is increasingly difficult in a virtualized and containerized world. This is all very important work. However, this is not the type of information that we should be expressing through a two-bit indicator. HTTPS is great, and everyone should use it, but it should be a matter of course, not a badge of honor. So that's it.